Thanks so much, Dean Lang, for that warm welcome. I have the honor of introducing a special guest and today's keynote speaker, Joshua Branch. Josh is a member of the 2012 stand-up class, recognized for his ad advocacy for the LGBTQ community while at Penn State. Since graduating, he has continued to exemplify ethical leadership as a champion for the rights of underserved communities. Josh went on to receive his law degree from Georgetown University, motivated by his passion for creating a world that truly values and supports children, which first requires ending practices and structures that give up on them. His career began as a teacher in Miami-Dade County for Teach for America. Seeing students at his school arrested for things like skipping class and roughhousing inspired him to pursue a law degree with a focus on juvenile justice. After law school, Josh became an education, juvenile defense, and foster care attorney who contributed to a historic class action lawsuit against Glen Mills Schools here in Pennsylvania for its abusive practices and civil rights violations. The lawsuit led to the facility's closure and a multi-state investigation. Josh has also worked for several organizations focused on criminal justice, serving as an advisor to Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer on major criminal justice reforms in those states. At Penn State, Josh stood up for justice, and since graduating, he has continued to stand up for justice. Please help me in welcoming 2012 Stand Up Awardee, Joshua Branch. Thank you, Ben, and um, I have to say I normally cringe when people give a bio uh, description, but that was, I, I appreciate that very kind um, introduction. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for having me. Uh, it was roughly 10 years ago that I was awarded uh, a stand-up award. Um, it was a humbling honor to receive it then, and it remains an honor to speak to this year's recipients. Um, I want to start by congratulating this year's recipients for this honor. Um, there are a variety of honors that you can achieve at your time at Penn State. Dean's lists, uh, club awards, selections to student government, thesis or research paper prizes. Uh, what makes the Stand Up Award unique uh, is that it uh, is given in your support for your courage, your leadership, your steadfastness. Uh, the award focuses on a core characteristic of you, um, your ethical leadership, which can and hopefully does remain a part of your career wherever it takes you. It's an interesting time for you to be receiving this award. Um, it seems right now the world is in a transition period of sorts. Globally speaking, Russia's longtime hegemonic power, legitimacy, and military strength um, is being questioned. Uh, the Israeli public are questioning the legitimacy of their state um, as, uh, as Prime Minister Netanyahu and his party continue to pass legislation, or at least try, that would uh, curtail the power of their highest courts. And South and Latin America countries uh, continue to struggle with the tension of economic modernization and expansion against the rights of indigenous peoples. Domestically, in the United States, we're also in a transition period of sorts. Uh, America's increased diversity has been met with uh, historic increases of white supremacist activity, including a proliferation of hate crimes. Um, trust in American institutions continues to drop. America also continues to be in a culture war, which um, originally started sleepily over political differences, um, now has evolved into debates of fact or revisionist history. I don't intend for the tenor of this to be uh, depressing or scary. Uh, this isn't the first time the world seems to be in a perilous place, and it certainly won't be the last. Uh, thankfully, it seems that the world um, has seen some human improvement each time it seems like we're at a destructive point. It's just my intention to highlight some of the very real challenges that you, as future leaders, uh, will be facing. 
And what I've highlighted is it's just the tip of the iceberg, really. Um, women's reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, censorship, disinformation, artificial intelligence, and climate change are all hurdles uh, that will have to be addressed with urgency soon. And often it's folks like yourselves who have positioned themselves or have been tapped as leaders who will be tasked with resolving those issues. Uh, the question for you is where will you position yourself to tackle these issues? What makes you so uniquely qualified to address these issues or be celebrated for leadership? In short, why are you here? And I've spent some time reflecting on small pieces of advice, um, and I've come away with a little bit of the following. Uh, there's a misconception that we have when we describe leaders. We often describe leaders as fearless. Um, I think that's an inaccurate way to describe some of the world's greatest leaders in any profession. Um, it falls into the fallacy of uh, rising to some unattainable godlike status. It suggests that fear is a negative attribute retained for mere mortals. Um, and when I think of truly fearless leaders, funnily enough, the only individuals that come up to mind are those whose uh, arrogance became a key point to their downfall. Whether it's the politician who thinks they're untouchable, uh, the business leader who thought their product had cornered the market, uh, financial experts whose hot streaks give them a sense of invincibility. To me, fearlessness often results in an inability to adapt or anticipate incoming threats uh, by its very definition, it doesn't view such challenges as a concern. I don't think fear should be deemed as weakness. A healthy sense of fear uh, can make for great leadership. It provides you the opportunity to understand the consequences of failure. It puts risks in the importance of goals and perspective. It's what, on a literal level, allows one to survive to fight another day. And for those embarking on years-long work, fear humbles us into focusing on uh, measured approaches and strategy. Uh, it's more accurate, in my opinion, to admire leaders we have etched into history for their strength. Strength is the ability to stay steadfast in your beliefs despite fear. Unlike fearlessness, which flouts potential concerns. Uh, strength acknowledges those concerns head on uh, while resolving to mitigate uh, the, um, uh, the potential downfalls. <clears throat> uh, strength is not born out of arrogance or hubris. Instead, it's forged in realism. It's focused on overcoming adversity. I hope that you can embody in your own unique way, humbling yourself to potential adversities, fears, or concerns while remaining grounded in your beliefs as you move forward. Um, personally, I try to observe and listen twice as much as I speak. My colleagues jokingly refer to me as the progressive Clarence Thomas in reference to Justice Thomas's reserved observational nature in the few times that he speaks. Uh, your data point is not accurate, so don't, don't take this moving forward. Um, funnily, it's one of the finest compliments I can receive, uh, followed up by, for a lawyer, you don't really talk that much. Um, it seems my colleagues in the legal profession often wear out their welcome at nonprofit meetings, but joking aside, uh, information is being shared non-verbally uh, in meetings and conversations, hearings and negotiations all the time. A simple nod, a raised eyebrow or shifts in body weight, um, a tentativeness or lack thereof, an individual's tone or the analogies they decide to use. All these actions uh, uh, can be signaling something. Sometimes it's even e easier. I'm oftentimes surprised at how much information individuals are willing to divulge by simply freely speaking their mind, giving me insight not only to their positions on issues, um, but also their opinions on stakeholders and their uh, own personalities. 
The traditional view of leadership involves a hierarchical structure with the leader at top or in the front of an organization, but this is just one form of leadership. For me, leadership helps uh, amplify voices, whether that's colleagues, directly impacted people, or mentors, mentees. Um, early in my career, I was working on a class action lawsuit that Ben had mentioned, and uh, I had spent a considerable amount of time uh, working on it as a junior attorney. And when you're a junior attorney, you're doing the bulk of the work. You're interviewing clients, formulating and researching legal theories. Um, and it's not uncommon for partners or big names within a nonprofit to end up being the face of that lawsuit uh, at the last moment, writing op-eds, uh, taking interviews. And while that's the norm in the legal profession and others, uh, it never felt right to me. It seemed an ironic inequity that those who put in the most work tended to be the most junior. Uh, they had their car uh, careers just starting out but they wouldn't be provided the opportunity to sort of share that limelight uh, as a partner would. The light was focused already on those who had already made a career mark for themselves. A few years later, I had the opportunity to be published in a legal journal at Georgetown based on work that two colleagues and I were working on. And learning from my past experiences, uh, I offered to co-write and co-publish the um, piece you're being celebrated as leaders, but remember what got you to this moment, whether that's an upbringing, mentors, uh, or other experiences. There's little doubt in my mind that you'll have various opportunities to further your career. And when the opportunity presents itself, I hope you think of how you can share that success, how you can share that publication or the interviews with junior colleagues, embodying a leadership style that doesn't prioritize your ego or your citations, but rather acknowledges supporting the next uh, generations of colleagues. And in doing so, uh, maybe you can impart uh, a bit of that leadership value onto them. Uh, the final note I wanna share with you is on authentic leadership. My first year teaching in Miami, um, I was told by several veteran leaders uh, and teachers at my school who had taught for over 10 years that I had to have control of my classroom. I remember one colleague telling me to try not to laugh, to try not to smile for a considerable amount of time in my middle school classroom. And for the first four or five months of teaching, I taught like a person I didn't know. Um, I kept a constant non-emotional demeanor. I yelled far too much. And I was tired, not physically, but emotionally. It's far too tiring to pretend you're something that you're not. Um, in my case, my students rightfully uh, told me at the end of the year, by which point I had dropped the military style of teaching, uh, that they thought it was funny how strict I was when I had started off. Um, they said that it didn't seem like me. It's part of why I love working with kids, their perspective, they're so blunt. Um, and later, when I was working in New Orleans, I sat next to a longtime advocate, at the time not knowing who she was, and she asked me who I was, um, where I was from. She could tell by my accent that I clearly wasn't from New Orleans. Um, and when I was done explaining, she perked up and cocked her head and asked, well, why are you here? Uh, it's a simple and powerful question, and it's one that we often don't ask ourselves enough before entering spaces. Why am I here, and, and what is my purpose? And I think it comes with uh, the time to understand yourself. Um, as you start your careers and leave for different spaces, I challenge you to ask yourself that question, why am I here, uh, in a bid to better understand yourself and your leadership. Um, in the 10 years I've, uh, I've spent since graduating uh, Penn State, I've learned a couple of things, and here's what they are. Um, I've, I've learned I'm empathetic, so much so that trial work and direct services can impact my mental health. Um, it can disrupt my sleep uh, to the point where it's better for me to work a level removed from direct advocacy. Um, that's where I best fit. I've learned through working in different states and cities that I need a support system. 
uh, and that sometimes being a car ride away from mom and dad isn't such a bad thing. And they'll be happy to hear that since this is recorded. Um, I've learned what it's like to be treated poorly uh, as an employee. I've learned how not to replicate that. I've learned that being vulnerable about my personal mental health history, my successes and failures in supporting uh, my sister with her mental health history has allowed other colleagues to open up about uh, personal issues that they've dealt with, drinking disorders, mental health struggles, uh, or general life advice. I've learned that uh, the closer I get to positions of power, um, the less black the room becomes. I'm oftentimes the only black man in the room. I've learned from older advocates that looking back on their life, that the work was important, but it's not uh, so important to impede on what matters most to you, whether that's uh, snuggling with a pet, a walk with a partner, or FaceTime with a friend. So <clears throat> I started this speech by telling you that the Stand Up Award is unique because it celebrates your leadership. And maybe you never felt like much of a leader yourself. Maybe you weren't trying to be a leader. What is true now is that you've been tapped to be a leader. You've been acknowledged for your accomplishments and the potential that others see in you. I hope you keep fostering these leadership skills in whatever capacity or field you feel to pursue. And I hope in 10 years time, you've learned more about yourself and have gotten a little bit closer in answering a simple and powerful question, why are you here? So thank you. Thank you, Josh, for that. Uh, when you won the award in 2012, I don't think we gave out <laughs> these. So this is a small token of our appreciation for being here to celebrate the next generation of ethical leaders and for continuing to embody the Stand Up Awards. Thank, Thank you. you.